Hello, I'm Gary Quinn, and welcome to another episode of Ready, Set, Live. My guest today is Christopher Giannanella, publisher at Modern Luxury Media, which includes Riviera Magazine, Palm Springs, Angelino Magazine, LA Confidential, California Interior, and many other top luxury brands. Don't go away. I'll be right back with Christopher. Hello, Christopher. Finally, great to have you in studio. Thank you for having me, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Pleasure to be here. Yes, you know, I followed your work and you're quite the, let's say, entrepreneur, you know? I try. You know, I noticed you're, um, you know, a father, uh, you have a family, you also are quite the wellness fitness uh, person. Um, and, 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 in any business, I think you have to have balance. Um, did you always do sports or always do some kind of wellness, fitness routine all your life? Or was I it mean, I, I, my dad was the president of the soccer club in my town. So there you have it. So I always had to sort of play soccer and do all that kind of stuff, which was great because that always kept me in shape and kind of built up my leg calves. So I always had my calf muscles from, mus from playing soccer. But, you know, I've always, always felt like if you felt good, and you were keeping physically fit, you kind of worked better. So I kind of kept that motto my whole life. And you know, obviously in college, we all slack a little bit. And then as I'm, when I moved to LA, I kind of got back into it and started my fitness regime again. So wow. there and I you, am. And you grew up in New Jersey. Yeah, I grew up in New Jersey. I'm a Jersey boy. I am too. I, oh, right I lived on, on the uh, south, uh, uh, New, uh, uh, Oceanport, Oceanport, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Uh, only, shore. only there for a short time before I found swimming. But um, so that, what, what brought you to Los Angeles? Okay, let's see. So I, I grew up in New Jersey, went to college in Wisconsin, and I got a job on the Hill for my local congressman, Congressman Dean Gallo. worked worked in D.C. and then my parents decided they were sick and tired of paying my rent. Uh -huh. So it was time to either get a real job. And at the time, it was tough to find a jo job in D.C. Um, it was right, right when uh, Bill Clinton was transitioning to be president and all, all this stuff. So anyway, I wound up with no job, went back to New Jersey, found a job in New York City uh, for a company called PIMS, worked there for about eight months, and then they transferred me to L.A. So it was kind of fun. I had an opportunity to either go to L.A. or Chicago, and I figured, hey, why not go to the place where the palm trees are there and the sun is always shining? So I wound up out here. Well, I always think that there, there are no wrong turns. I believe everything is set into motion for one door opens, two doors close, and then third door opens. So uh, bringing yourself to L.A., you sort of find your way here. You know, L.A. is a city where... I don't think there's anywhere else in the world like Los Angeles because um, you can create your own world here and then take it out into the world, uh, which is amazing. And you are the publisher of so many amazing magazines here in the South uh, Southern California. Um, what? How did that happen? It's a, it's actually a really great story. So I started dating. Andrea, who's my wife, uh -huh. and it was around 1999, and she felt that I needed a new career path. You know, I said, okay, so what do you think I should do? And she had brought a copy of Angelino Magazine home, and the gentleman who was the publisher was Michael Kong, who you may know. Uh, Michael's picture was in there with his, you know, his phone number and his email address, so I contacted him and I said, hey, you know, my, my fiance thinks I'd be a great salesperson and I don't know, but I understand salespeople get paid commission only, right? So you really have nothing to lose. So give me a shot. So I went in, met with him, and I started on that day and I actually shared an office with him. We were right in that um, building on Wilshire, which is that high rise where E used to be. It was that white oh, yes. building right next to Variety. Yes. And I shared an office with him and literally listened to every phone conversation he had and saw how he reacted to the clientele. And Angelino had just been launched that year. Um, we had Claire Forlani on our first cover. So I came on board and, you know, I immediately 
walked up and down Robertson Boulevard and Beverly and La Brea and La Cienega and, and created relationships with all the store owners, mm -hmm. uh, you know, retail, restaurants. And, you know, the first issue, I think I closed about $50,000 in business and they were all in shock. And I said, well, what are you all in shock for? Isn't this what you hired me to do? Like, this is my job. Uh -huh. So Michael had given me a pen, which was I still have today, um, which was a really remarkable thing to have this really cool pen for my, my sales ability. And, you know, as the years went by, I, it grew and grew, and I became the ad director, then the associate publisher, then the publisher. I was moved down to Newport Beach to run the Orange County market. You know, and as, you know, time evolves, you just kind of, you know, maintain your, your credibility in the community, and here I am today. You know? Excellent. I think you did something on me in this magazine many oh, years ago yeah. with one of my books. But um, the luxury brand market seems to always uh, pop up around the world. What, what are you striving for all your magazines to kind of bring up to speed in the luxury market world? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. We feel luxury always has a place. And the beauty of modern luxury in, 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 in our eyes is that we are a national brand with a local feel. So every magazine you pick up, whether you're in any of our 22 markets across the country, from Miami, New York, San Francisco, we want the feel to be there. So the brand identity is always there. And the beauty is we have so much great local contact, uh, local content connected with national content that the magazine has a great feel to it. So it feels national, it feels luxury, and actually it speaks to, to the audience that, that we cater to. Well, what I found is, you know, a lot of my clientele is in the luxury brand market and they've sought me out for my spiritual balance. Um, and that was interesting because I think um, sometimes people lose the balance. They're so much into the luxury that once they get all the luxury, they find something's missing. And then they go, I'm really not happy. I have this beautiful house. I have the Rolls Royce. I have the Lamborghini, but I'm not happy. Yeah. And so I think that the magazine uh, is is a world kind of vision because there's, you know, every every country has their luxury brand uh, magazines. But um, what makes yours completely different than others? Mm -hmm. What's what's the so. Um, basically, I think what makes us, what sets us apart mm -hmm. from some of the other luxury magazines is that really our, our ability to maintain local community content, maintain relationships in the local communities. I think it's important because I think, as you said, luxury has different meanings, you know, and I think for us, we have the aspirational market, we have the luxury market, and, you know, we, we take people away from their everyday woes of the news and sports and politics. We don't want to be that. We want to be something that really takes your mind off of your everyday problems and takes you to a really cool destination or a great new restaurant or a new shopping street to, to encounter or a great real estate property to look at. So that's kind of where we set ourselves apart from some of our other competitors. Why do you think people in today's world are not happy? In, in life. Business, in life? In life. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we've been through the mill lately in the past <laughs> two months, right? So I think there's a lot of people who are, are kind of rediscovering. So I don't know if people are unhappy. Um, but I think people might be unhappy with the political environment that we're in, which I try not to talk about. But that's one, one thing out there. And I think also, I think people are maybe interested in trying new things. And I think I spoke to a lot of different people who, because of the pandemic, have rediscovered themselves. Maybe they had a liking for sports cars, so now they're getting involved in that. Or wine, so now they're becoming wine sommeliers. Or actors who never thought about acting before. You know? So I think there's a, a chance to rediscover. And I think sometimes when you don't know what's next, it could be a little scary. Correct. And I think during this pandemic, people have had to go within and really find out what works and what doesn't work in their lives. Yeah. And many have deleted a lot of things in their life and started to add uh, a new beginning for them. So I think that, 
you know, the balance is 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 reviving themselves and reinventing themselves as right. everybody does. Yep. Um, what does the soul mean to you? My personal soul. Uh-huh. So, you know, I'm an interesting kind of guy. I, I wake up every morning and I take each day as it comes. And I do think about the future. I don't really think about the past. And I think about what I'm going to do that day. And I feel that maybe that's where my strengths are, which keeps my soul alive. Because I feel like if I can get through the day and nothing bad happened to me, I had a great day. And I always say this to my son, like if something bad happens in his day, and I always say, if this is the worst thing that you went through today, you had a great day, right? So I live day to day. Maybe that's why I've been with Modern Luxury for 22 years, because this is what I do. This is what I, I, I eat, breathe, and sleep everything that we do. And I, I have so, so much care for, for our clients, our readers, our content, our employees. So that's kind of what keeps my soul alive, mm. so to speak. What has been, um, Christopher, what's been the biggest challenge you think you had to overcome up until this point? So I, believe it or not, I could be very unorganized. And I think that could be a problem, right? So I'm always trying so hard to write things down, keep, you know, I'm, I'm old school. I don't have, I have a notepad with me at all times. I jot everything down. But I think for me, that's always been a challenge. Always trying to keep on top of organization. Um, but it's also strange because I have a little bit of ADD, so I've been told. So my mind is always wandering all over the place. But then I also want to make sure everything's neat and orderly in my home. So... I don't know. Maybe I'm are, are you, a hot mess. I don't no, know. No, 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 no. Are you one of these persons <laughs> that if I went to your house, it would, everything would be color coded? Not too <laughs> okay. much. But, I've seen that. Yeah. But, you know, the dishes will all be put Organized. away. Okay. I make my bed every day. Okay. You know, things like that right. where well, you just kind of go through. I feel like if my bed's not made, uh, my day's a mess. Well, yes. So that and, signifies and what kind of day I'm going to have. Exactly. And, and there's a, an old saying, if you open someone's trunk in their back of their car and it's a mess, yeah. their mind is a mess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my trunk's pretty organized. I, mean, yeah. I, I just went in it now and everything's in order. <laughs> I got my gym stuff, the magazines. I think my golf clubs are in there, but it's pretty organized. So your gym stuff, talk about that. I mean, I saw a picture of you that oh should boy. have been on the cover of Men's Health. Oh, wow. Thank you. Uh, you work out daily or, or every couple of days? You know, it's or funny because, you... you know, people think when you're in good shape, you must work out every day. But literally what I learned, and I learned this from a gentleman named Todd Vandehei, who owns Stark Fitness down in Newport, when I was turning 40 back in 2010, I had written a little piece in my publisher's note about how I wanted to get into the best shape of my life. And Todd read the piece and he said, hey, I'm starting a new gym here in Newport. I'd love for you to come in. And I said, okay. So I went in and he kind of taught me nutrition is 80% of it. And the other 20% is actually working out. So believe it or not, I worked out maybe three days a week, heavy lifting, right? So that's three hours a week. Did some cardio. I made sure I did my, my steps um, pretty much, you know, a few times a week as well. But most of it is what you put into your body. And I, I didn't know that. I just thought if you ate, you could eat whatever you want as long as you went to the gym. But that's not true. Mm -mm. So um, I, it was really interesting. They started a program called Stark Naked, which is the photo you're referring to. But back then, uh, they had the idea was to train five men and five women in business like bodybuilders. So they taught you how to eat the supplements, the whole regime. And at that time, I was a little bit heavier, even though I thought I was in great shape, but I was trying to lose fat. So I went on this intermittent fasting situation that really helped me out. Uh, entered the contest. Um, eight months later, I actually won the contest, believe it or not. And then fast forward 10 years later, um, they brought back the all-stars. So I did it again in my 50s, stark naked. And I had some fun this time because I kind of knew um, how it worked originally, but there were so many changes in fitness these days that there's a lot of stuff I didn't know. So having your blood work checked, having your, you know, seeing what foods you're allergic to. So I learned a lot of new things in the process. But again, at the end of the day, it really is about nutrition, 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 and, and what you put into your body. Um, have you passed that on to your son? Yeah, well, he's, it's funny, I, I try to bring him, drag him with me down to the gym sometimes in our building, but 
he's more of a, an active, he loves rowing. He was a diver. I know you were on the mm. swimmer, but he used to dive at USC. Um, and that was sort of his sports. He's never, he's not a contact sport kind of guy. He's more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. So the rowing has been great. And so I'm keeping him, keeping him active that way. If you were granted one wish for humanity and our planet, what would that be? Such a great question and so fitting for what is going on, especially in a city like Los Angeles. And I really, you know, my heart goes out to the people that don't have a place to sleep, a place to eat. And I was watching the news this morning and obviously there's a big, you know, lottery out there for 1.1 billion. And they were asking people what they would do with the money. And it was really interesting in that one gentleman said that he would build a row of like a whole street block in downtown LA to help the homeless. And I think it's just a, a common thing we all have where you want to be able to help those people in need. And I think if we could find something to do that, the world would be a better place. Exactly. Um, Christopher, if you could go back into time and ask one question from anyone in history, who would you want to meet and what question would you ask? Ooh, love it. So I love, there was a show called Fantasy Island back in the 80s, and I always imagined being on that show and creating some sort of life. And I remember there were always episodes where people went back in time, right? And I think it'd be really fun to meet my great-grandfather, who I never met in my life, and kind of hear about his journey coming from Italy to the United States and just kind of putting myself out there what was life like for you, you know? And also those decisions he made that brought me here today. Because if he had made any different decisions, I may not be here today. So I think it'd be fun to meet some of our ancestors from the past um, and just kind of see the similarities that maybe I have with them and, and kind of hear their journeys and what life was like. So I always, I always live in that world. And one thing I, I'm a big guru of out here, which I love is, is Los Angeles. And I always wanted to come back in time and come to L.A. in 1950 and see, like, what was happening, like, with the Derby on, in, you know, Los Feliz. And I know Chasen's was the hottest restaurant in town. I'd love to have a table at Chasen's. Now it's Bristol Farms, right? right. <laughs> so it'd be fun to kind of come back in time. And I, I love that question because those are the things I think about um, when I have nothing else to think about. Uh, Bristol Farms is Adele's favorite sushi place. Oh, that's she right. I got my there. sushi too. <laughs> yeah. And I sit at the booth. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. funny. I, I haven't seen her several. there. Um, I would love to come back and see Hollywood in the 1930s mm -hmm. when it was booming. When, when you see these pictures of Hollywood Boulevard was a dirt road yeah. and orange fields everywhere. Yeah. Um, to me, that was sort of a, a time that we don't really know. You know, I had the opportunity to um, know uh, uh, an actress. Uh, uh, why can't I think? She was a swimmer. Um, why can't I? Um, oh, Esther Williams? Esther Williams. Esther Williams. And I, I knew her the last two years of her life, and she used to – I was fascinated to sit with her because she thought I was with her during those times. And she would go into stories about, do you remember when we were at Perino's? I said, no, tell me what happened. I was just, and then she said, you know, uh, I don't know if Mr. DeMille, you know, really understood about, you know, because she was basically a sales clerk yeah. uh, at the Bullock's Wilshire. And they kept saying, you should be an actress. But I'm so fascinated, and I was talking to some one of my clients about the Hollywood history with the houses, the mm -hmm. homes in L.A., and he, he knows everybody who lived there. He said yep. Rosemary Clooney lived there. That's where, you know, George lived when he first came to Hollywood. Yep. So it's really about memorabilia. I think there should be some kind of section in your magazine that mm -hmm. you talk about that sometimes mm -hmm. because there's a lot of yeah. history here. I agree. I was at the uh, Rainbow for the first time the other night. I've never been there. And we sat at the iconic booth that I guess Kiss owned when mm -hmm. they used to come in there. So I didn't know about that. Yeah. So um, I think it's just history is amazing. Yeah. Well, we did a piece during the pandemic about 1930s, uh, what they went through during the Spanish flu in L.A., what happened on the movie sets, which is actually a really cool piece. Our editor at the time wrote something phenomenal 
I adored the piece and it was really unique because again, it's bringing that history back. And another fun story is I remember uh, we do a feature called Dynamic Women every fall. We feature these wonderful women in business and we had Jacqueline Smith as our celebrity dynamic woman. And I remember, uh, you know, I met her, we shot her at her house and she lived right, well, I'm not gonna say where, but somewhere off Sunset Boulevard. And I said to her, I said, wow, so you've lived in this house for 30 years, 30 plus years, and where was Charlie's Angels filmed? And she said, well, it was actually where um, Fox Plaza is, is where they filmed. So I'm like, so you would drive down this street, make a left on Wilshire, make a right, and it was just funny that now that we're here now, seeing what these people did at the time like it was just amazing to me correct and it was so and everything was so local everything was so localized correct. like it wasn't far for jacqueline smith to get to work but then you see her on charlie's angels you think wow this is insane like this, yeah, this yeah, great yeah. tv show but it was like down the street from where she lived yeah it's really amazing and i was talking to somebody about the old hollywood that these kind of actors really don't exist anymore it's a different type yeah. You know, when I first came to Hollywood, I had the opportunity to meet Charles Bronson mm -hmm. and Jill Ireland on the set of their movie because I was working with Terry Garr and Raul Julia. And so I, I, I just remember these people had such a different energy. It was very magical. Well, I think it was magical because this is pre-social media. Yes. So it was a time where, you know, it's funny. I remember I went to my first Bikram yoga class on Robertson and Wilshire. I went there too. And in front too. of me was Raquel Welsh. And I was like, what? Raquel Welsh is in front of me? But back then, you know, then you're leaving Bikram Yoga and there's a, you know, people are taking pictures and that would wind up in People Magazine. Yeah. So it was interesting, like the celebrities were more of an enigma then. So when you saw them, it was like, wow. Like, I went there to they that, are. Uh, Bikram with Robert Downey Jr. because I had met him through Nastasia Kinski, who I was working with. And I thought, oh, I'll just wear, you know, a regular, you know, yeah. jumpsuit or whatever. It was so hot in there, I could not breathe. And then I, I didn't get to wear the memo. A bathing it, was, suit. it was a sweat yes, yoga class. I didn't know. Yeah. And so then I started to wear a bathing suit. But <laughs> and he said, turn around, you must do this. And he had the microphone in yep. his head, and you know, it was very interesting. But it was a great workout. Do you still do hot yoga or not? I don't really? do hot yoga. Yeah, I don't either. Mm -hmm. I wish I did, but it was I intense. Know. It was very popular in Japan yeah. Yeah. for a moment. But also, if it had, if there was a rug, the smell was really fierce. Correct. So you make sure it was sort of a hardwood yeah. floor situation, then you'd be you'd be better off. Yeah, yeah. What is your, let's say, I don't want to say bucket list. What's on the list that you haven't accomplished yet that you or you'd like to go somewhere? or see something that you say, I'm gonna climb yeah. Mount Kilimanjaro. Oh no, I don't wanna do that, I don't know. I wanna live, who knows. I, you know, I've never been to any of the Asian countries like China, Japan. I'd love to go to a country where I don't, I can't understand the language. Correct. Again, just to see how I, how I would you get You would by. love Japan. I have been teaching there for 17 years. I don't speak a word of Japanese, but the country the 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 temples the the p everything is is perfect mm -hmm. it's it's precise but in the beginning my first time there i was overwhelmed by all the lights it was vegas oh my god i can't handle this mm -hmm. and the people but now that i've relaxed into it i love it yeah everything you can never find a, a bad meal anywhere yeah and everything is primo the best it, it's a luxury brand market there mm -hmm. also yeah um so when you go, I'll give you all the spots because Terrific. you would love it. Yeah, I love vacation. My son's like this too. We like vacations where we can see things, learn things. I mean, going to Hawaii and staying in a hotel and going down to the pool and to the beach. And the you could do that yeah. here. Yeah. You know, so I feel like I always want to go somewhere that you can kind of learn something Italy. new. Yeah, Italy for sure. What I mean, part I've, of Italy was your grandfather? So my from? ancestors are from Naples okay. <coughs> and Bari. Napolitana. <laughs> Napolitana and Bari. But I haven't been to that region at all. Okay. <clears throat> the only time I've been to Italy was my wife and I went to France, to mm -hmm. Nice, Cannes. And then we drove up through, um, I forgot, maybe Switzerland, mm -hmm. into... Um, What's the name of that? San Remo. San Remo, yes. So that's where I've been. Okay, San so Remo. So I would love to do the Rome, you, Venice, and all that. Should, that. That's gonna happen Sicily. soon. Sicily, you should do yeah. Sicily, and but 
Uh, San Remo is famous. They have a big uh, musical concert uh, yeah. every year. Yeah. But um, definitely, since your ancestors are there, it's important that you go back. Maybe I'll see them. You it's might funny. See them. Speaking of that, I remember when I was in France. Was it, remember the time when you had film developed, where yes. you took pictures? Yes. And you had, I got my pictures back. This is 2002. And it was such an eerie sight. I'm looking at a photo of my, my wife and I. And in the background, I see a woman standing there. And she looked exactly like my grandmother. Interesting. And then, ironically, I don't know if you believe in mediums. I, I do. do. I do. I used to not. But I had t uh, two incidences with a medium. One was in Mission Viejo, a woman named Tracy, who I had gone to see because it was sort of like everyone was going to see her. And I remember her telling me that there was a gentleman there to see me. Um, and he was a very handsome man with a mustache. And he said he was your, for your grandfather, the first grandparent to pass away. And it was really interesting because he said things to me that I reiterated to my dad. And my dad was hysterical saying, wow, dad used to tell me these things too. Mm -hmm. So that happened. And it was kind of interesting. Because there's, you know, I'm not going to get into the drama of anything, but there were things that took place. But he knew and he apologized to me for some of the things that had happened in the past, which I thought was remarkable, Interesting. which let me move on. Because there was always things that kind of held me back a little bit because I've always sort of been, you know, an obedient kid who always like, you know, was great. And I didn't realize my grandfather had some issues in his life that he had to overcome, um, you know. But anyway, so fast forward and during that seating. She also, I also said, is he with my grandmother? You know, and they were this lady with red hair who was laughing. And she's the one. And, and she also said she was with you on that trip to France. Wow. So I'm thinking, wow, mm -hmm. she was in that picture, right? Yeah. So, Well, you know, it's almost like we travel in, in, in packs. Yeah. And everybody in alignment we've been with before in some lifetime. I know that all the countries I go to, I've had past lives in because yeah. I've had experiences there when right, I'm there. Right, right. Um, so I do believe that your um, conne our connection is about just really being intuitive yeah. to connect. Yeah. Um, what does love mean to you? It's funny, I love that question too. And I had this conversation do you know who Jeff Berry is? He's a, a composer. He wrote the song Chapel of Love. He wrote um, a lot of songs for the Ronettes. Didn't he write the he Idol wrote, Maker? Maybe. Uh, I ran into Jeff him Berry. in Sunset Plaza, and, mm -hmm. and I, these are the people I love to see. And we were meeting, he said, my name is Jeff Berry, and we were chatting. And I said, wait, I know that name from somewhere. And it turned out he was the gentleman who wrote the songs. And he always said to me, I write about love, but I've never had love. I never really knew what love was. And I think it's something that, you know, you don't really know what, what love is until you actually feel it. And I remember when I first met my wife, I had never really been in love before. I've had, you know, girlfriends, whatever, but never this feeling of like, wow, butterflies. And this is like someone that I want to know what they're doing morning, noon, and night. And I can't wait to see them when they get home from work and all that good stuff. And, you know, my son is now 16 and, you know, we're, we're waiting to see how he finds love, right? Because, you know, who knows? But, and I always tell him it comes when you, when you least expect it. So, well, I also think in order to love someone, you really have to learn to love yourself. Exactly. First. I agree. I agree. And then you can move into And some that. people might think I love myself too much because I'm <laughs> posting a shirtless picture on Instagram, but I'm trying to inspire others. Correct. Right? That's Inspiring how I look at it. Inspiring is the word. Right? Inspiring. But you're right. Chris. If you're not happy with who you are on the inside and out, Correct. how do you expect anybody else to love you? Exactly. What does heaven mean to you in one word? I'm going to say peace. Okay. Um, and as we spoke earlier, I feel like I can't wait to get to heaven because I get to see that great grandparent who I wanted to see on Fantasy Island back in, you know, 1930 or 40 or whenever it was. Correct. So I think heaven is going to be a, pla a place of peace. And, you know, hopefully I won't get there soon. Hopefully I'll Correct. got many more years yes. until I get there, but who knows. <laughs> so if people want to see this amazing picture of Christopher, oh God. go to at Christopher G-I-A, your Instagram, and you can see it. Uh, if you'd like to know more about some of these amazing magazines, fantastic LA Confidential, the Riviera, Riviera. Uh, Palm yes. Springs, yes. um, and Angelino, you can go at uh, Modern Luxury 
uh, is the uh, Instagram. Um, it was such a pleasure, Christopher, after all these years to finally meet. Yeah, I mean, you're a legend, Gary. And uh, <laughs> as think? I said earlier, you're sure you wanted me on your show? I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. And especially a guy with your stature and what you've done. And I have a question for you. Yes. What is your, tell me your, your best memory of, of life in LA. Um, like what's your LA story? I think you tell people? the best memory was when I was training for the Olympics and I came to Los Angeles and I had an opportunity to come and see, uh, a sh uh, meet Penny Marshall and Rob Reiner, who I had met in Mission Viejo, where I was training. Oh, with uh, Not the Adores, Adores? Mark yeah. Schubert. Yeah, actually, Mark Schubert was at, at uh, USC. Your son probably. Um, and uh, I was driving through the Paramount gates. I'm just a swimmer, 22 years old or 23, whatever. And I remember the feeling. I'm gonna be working here. This is home. And I drove through the gates and there was this ting, almost like it was being raining of miracles. And I parked at the blue sky. There used to be the blue sky there. And I walked in and that day I met Lucille Ball. I met, wow. uh, I met uh, Spock, uh, Leonard, Leonard Nimoy. I met all the cast from Happy Days. It, it was like a magical time, like the circus. And I, I, I basically felt, wow, I'm, I'm kind of home. <laughs> and that was, I'll never forget that, that, Feeling. I think we all had, it's funny, just one more quick story uh, about celebrities. Uh, I remember there was a, a jazz club called Lunaria on Santa Monica Boulevard in Beverly Glen. Do you remember this I place? I do. They were one of my clients, and I was invited to a dinner one night, and it was myself, uh, Phyllis Diller, B. Arthur, Conrad Bain, and Pam Dauber sitting at a table, right? And I sat next to Phyllis Diller, who r r reminds me of what Lucille Ball was probably like, the same kind of vibe. Correct. I remember uh, she was on one of those HBO late night comedy shows when HBO used to have these great. I remember one of her jokes was, I put on a peekaboo blouse and my husband peeked and booed, right? <laughs> and I remember when I met her, I couldn't wait to tell her, I love the joke. And then she said to me, it's so funny you bring that up because Merv Griffin is the one who told me about that joke. So I think it's fun that our generation learns things from that old Hollywood yes. generation. But I remember B. Arthur did not want anything to do with me. She didn't even smile, didn't say anything. Conrad Bain was friendly, you know, from different yes, strokes. Yes, I met I him and talking Pam to Dauber, him about it. Right. Pam was great, but yeah. B was tough. What you, I guess, what you see on the outside. Correct. She was. She well, was I, like I think that. some of these women had this tough side about them. Yeah. Because Lucy was very tough. Oh, was she? Very yeah. tough. Um, so I thank you for coming in. We could talk another yes, hour. I know. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for watching Ready, Set, Live. You can follow me on Instagram, and we'll be coming to you on the Roku channel soon. Uh, and until next time, stay close, be well. I'm Gary Quinn.